Um, welcome everybody. My name is Erica Quach and I am a senior program officer at the National Committee on US-China Relations. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us for this panel discussion on the film Beethoven in Beijing. We will begin with a moderated panel discussion and then turn it over to Q&A from the audience. Um, so if you have any questions for our panelists throughout the program, you can submit it using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen at any time. Um, so please be sure to leave your name and affiliation if possible. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for tonight's panel discussion. Jennifer Lin is a journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker. She created and co-directed Beethoven in Beijing, the film featured tonight which I hope most of you were able to watch during this past week. If not, the film will be available on our website until the end of the week. Booker Rowe was a violinist with the Philadelphia Orchestra for 50 years before his retirement in 2020. He is one of the musicians who traveled with the Philadelphia Orchestra to China in 1973. Sheila Melvin is a writer and consultant focusing on both culture and business. She and her husband, Jin Dong Tai, featured on the film as well, um, authored several books on classical music in China. Last, but certainly not least, is pianist Jia Chen, who is the founding dean of the music department at the University of Shanghai for Science and Technology. She is currently head of development for West Kowloon Cultural District Authority of Performing Arts. So those are our speakers for tonight, and a warm welcome to all of them. Um, their full bios are posted on our event webpage, so you can click on the link. It'll be in the chat shortly um, if you're curious about all their other accolades. Uh, so let's get started with the discussion. I first want to congratulate Jennifer on Jennifer Lin on the film. I've watched it too many times to count, <laughs> and not only because of the rich content, but also because I love the way that you piece together the archival and contemporary footage. I think you did that really seamlessly. Um, but let's start with a little bit of background behind the film. Can you tell us about the process getting into creating it and what sparked the initial idea for it? Yeah, well, Erica, thank you for this, for putting together this panel and for inviting me to talk about the movie. Um, I used to work as a newspaper reporter. And in fact, I spent most of my professional career as a journalist for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And in the late 1990s, I was stationed in Beijing and covered China for the newspaper and Knight Ritter newspapers. And it was in 2008, I was living back in Philadelphia, uh, but my editors asked me to go to China to cover an anniversary concert that the Philadelphia Orchestra was invited to. And this was in Beijing to mark the 35th anniversary of the 1973 tour. So again, the year is 2008 and the classical music critics, critics couldn't make the trip. They were busy doing other things. So my editors asked me to go and um, you know, I, I'm not a classical music expert, but I do know my way around China. So when I went in 2008, it had been like 10 years since I lived in China. And I was really surprised at the way classical music was experiencing a real revival. There was so much interest, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there were new concert halls being built. The NCPA had just opened the big egg in Beijing. Uh, you know, there were new, auditoriums and concert halls in Shanghai, in, in uh, Guangzhou. And there was a real resurgence. When I went to the anniversary concert, I talked to a lot of the Chinese people uh, going to the concert. Uh, and I was really struck by the degree of nostalgia that everyone had for the Philadelphia Orchestra. It wasn't just an interest in classical music. It was an interest in this orchestra. And people really remember the 1973 trip and how that was kind of the start of, of something, uh, of more of a, a, you know, a cultural relationship between China and the United States. And so I wrote my stories, I, I, you know, I covered the event. And when I got back to Philadelphia, I really thought that this was a story that should be seen and heard as well as, well as you know, reading about it. So I kind of kept it in the back of my mind 
that this would be, you know, an interesting documentary. Uh, one of the reasons is, you know, lots of people know about ping pong diplomacy, and I know you're going to have a, a panel on that next week, but not enough people know about music diplomacy and how uh, Zhou Enlai and, and, you know, the Chinese leadership really used music as a way of kind of renewing relations with the West and the United States in particular. So I left the newspaper in 2015 and I, I pitched the orchestra, I said, you know, on the idea of a documentary and it took us six years, but we finally did it. And it, it was uh, almost a year ago to the date that we were um, broadcast nationally on PBS's great performances. So it was a long process, but, but the genesis really was that 2008 concert that I covered in Beijing. Thanks for that background. Um, when I, one thing that I really, one of many things that I really love about the film is getting the chance to hear the musicians who traveled to China in 1973 talk about their experiences and share their anecdotes. So um, Booker, can I turn it over to you to talk about what it was like to travel to China in 1973? Yes, all right, I'll try not to be too lengthy. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, well, once everything was, was settled with all of the official uh, preparations, and we were invited and Mr. Ormandy uh, was ready to go. Actually, he was sent ahead of us. He was sent ahead of us uh, for the sake of getting rid of jet lag. Uh, he left on, I think, uh, the Thursday before we, we left on a Monday, the 10th of September, 73. And um, uh, he joined us in Honolulu when we got to Honolulu. We, we took off with 130 tour personnel, 106 um, musicians, um, and on a Pan-American Air charter. And it was called the Clipper Philadelphia Orchestra. And we, we first went to San Francisco to refuel. Uh, we went to Honolulu and stayed overnight, where Mr. Orbany joined us. Uh, I, for about that, I, I remember his birds singing in the trees the next morning when we couldn't see them. <laughs> Hundreds of birds, it sounded like. And uh, we went on to, um, uh, stopped in Japan on the way to Shanghai. And when we landed, um, we, were, we, we stopped there, it was a pretty empty. Uh, we were taken to a terminal for a port of entry. Um, where they had little red books that were Mao Zedong's teachings. And, and they had them in lots of languages. So I, they were free of charge. I picked up about four of them. One in Italian, one in Chinese, and one in English, two in English actually. Um, they also had the Chinese military caps. Um, their stores just about ran out. Uh, <laughs> guys getting everything. So we left there. Um, and uh, we flew on to Peking, arrived there at 9 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, the 13th of September. There were two lines of official greeters on both sides. Um, there were in, including representatives of the committee for friendship with foreign nations. And uh, also a Chinese pianist uh, uh, who's going to be the soloist and there's Yin, I, think, I hope I can pronounce it, Yin Ching Cheng, Yin Ching Chung. I don't know if that rings a bell, but he's the guy that was second in the 1958 Tchaikovsky competition. Um, the, the one that, um, oh God, uh, the Texan, what was, it? what was his name? Everybody knows his name except, and I know it too, but I can't get it. Uh, Van Clyburn won that competition. And uh, uh, Ching Chung came in second. Is a heck of a technician he is. Um, when we actually got in uh, to our hotel, uh, we, I stayed in the Chen Men Hotel. Um, in the morning, I was awakened with um, morning exercises. I thought it was troop movements. So there were, it, was, it was like a platoon of people running running and getting their exercise with a, a platoon leader leading them running backwards. Um, 
there's so much more, but in, in, I can't continue to talk about that. Um, that evening we played, this was a Thursday evening, we played the concert. Actually, we didn't play. The concert was given by the Central Philharmonic Society uh, of the People's Republic of China. And they exhibited uh, real skill. They had a beautiful choir, um, a chorus that sang America the Beautiful. And they sang it both in Chinese and in English. The second part was in English. Uh, there were also ancient instrument players played the Xing, the Air Hu, the Qing, the Pan Hu, the Pipa, and also traditional piano. And they were all virtuosi. Um, and of those instruments, uh, quickly, I don't know if you can see this, but this is this is this is an instrument I brought back. Can you see that? Yeah. That's the Air Hu. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I love the the, the, the the carving uh -huh. of the dragon. Oh, that's amazing. It, it has it has no strings on it now. The strings wore out. I had to get some more strings. Um, and that's that's the instrument. This is the bow, and it's the hair is just about gone now. But <laughs> this was the bow, 1973. Uh, that was one of the instruments, and I also brought this back, the air hoo. It's like a, a large pipe organ. Wow. And that's the mile you blow through that. There's bamboo up here. You see the bamboo, different, different lengths to make different pitches. Mm -hmm. uh, they also, on that program, they did a, a, a musical setting of five poems by Mao Zedong. And I have a program from that, which is both in Chinese at the beginning and English at the end. Um, anyway, the evening, they had a welcoming banquet, which was hosted by the, by the Committee of Friendship. Um, and who, they all toasted to international friendship and uh, pre proceeded to give us a 12 course menu for dinner. <laughs> um, I could go on and on with this, but I wanna just get in some of my own other personal, um, personal anecdotes, I guess you might say. Uh, number two here, I'm skipping number one because it's pretty much the same. Once we got in, I mean, there were throngs of welcomers on both sides of the street the whole way. It was, it was like a C. Cecil B. DeMille type Hollywood presentation. I couldn't believe it. None of us could believe it. But um, and when we landed, I mean, I, what struck me was everybody was Chinese. <laughs> it meant that everybody, no matter what their occupation, was Chinese. And uh, that, that stuck in my mind. And what further stuck in my mind was no matter what they did, they did it with pride and they, and they did it well. So, and, you know, going through all these throngs of people on buses, well, they used the old buses and we were very, very bumpy buses. I remember that, um, but they got us there. Uh, and throughout the bus routes, there were crowds, I mean, for miles. It seemed like it was staged, but they seemed very, very sincere and, and warm and welcoming. Uh, there were, well, there was one day on the plane, actually on the plane over, they told us that we shouldn't, when we got into Peking, we shouldn't walk on the street in, for, in groups of less than two, <laughs> a group of one, in other words, uh, and don't go alone and uh, don't go in more than three or four people because they had um, people standing on the corners uh, uh, who would report that to their, to their superiors and it could work its way up to the government uh, and you'd have an international incident. Well, none of that ever happened, but after, after so much uh, tr wonderful treatment that we got, I actually forgot and I went out for a walk one day 
And I got it, I walked into a square uh, thinking my mind was, was in, in action and I was thinking, so I was looking down and I heard clapping. I looked up and these chi- there were children clapping and they looked like they were clapping towards me. I looked around, I saw no one else. So I realized that they were, and I began to clap back because we were told that that's what we should do is, is, is clap back. And on the stage, for instance, when we're playing a concert uh, and we end the concert or end a piece and we have applause, we have to return the, the applause by clapping. And that, that, was the, that was what they did at that time. Um, and it made sense to me because the composer is the one who writes the music. The performer is interpreting the music. And then there has to be a listener. So the audience is the listener and that completes the cycle. Right. Yeah. So that, that made complete sense to me that you should applaud back when you have listened and, and uh, been so inspired by what you've heard or seen on stage. Um, oh, that that's great. Um, I I actually I have a question. Um, following that story, that anecdote, actually, there was so much love for, you know, Beethoven and classical music at that time. It was they applauded, right? Um, yes. But I was I was wondering where that came from, and I I wonder if Sheila can answer this question about where this appeal for Beethoven in China came from. Um, Sheila, can you tell us why China fell in love with Beethoven in 1970s and how that affected the course of classical music um, in the decades that followed until today? Sure, I would actually say, that was fascinating to hear your stories, Booker, thank you. Yeah, Um, I would actually say that uh, China fell in love with Beethoven at the turn of the 20th century. so, So much earlier than the 1970s. It was at, at the time, you know, in, in like in 1900s, you know, it was the Boxer Rebellion. China was being colonized. It was being carved apart by foreign nations. There were rebellions. It was a really bad period for China. And many Chinese intellectuals who were able were trying to seek ways to change their nation's future. They wanted to discover the secret of Western wealth and power. How come these countries from so far away could come and, you know, colonize China? And they were interested in new role models and new ideas and new ways of thinking. So many of them went overseas to try and learn from the nations that were actually literally tearing China apart. And the closest place to go was Japan. And Japan, of course, had already been absorbed a lot of Western culture um, after Admiral Perry and everything. So they had the Meiji Restoration. So they had Western culture. And so some of these intellectuals went to Japan and one named Li Shutong actually discovered Beethoven there. He first learned about Beethoven in Japan and he wrote an article about it in a small music magazine that he created. And he drew a sketch of Beethoven and he wrote a very short biography of Beethoven in which he emphasized how Beethoven had overcome so much hardship in his life. You know, he had a terrible relationship with his father. He never got married. He went deaf in the prime of his career but he kept composing music. He kept struggling and he kept succeeding. So he held up Beethoven as sort of a role model for, for China and how it had to keep working to overcome hardship and reinvent itself. And he actually called his article, The Sage of Music. So he set Beethoven up as a new kind of sage from modern China. And then this tradition just kind of went on. More people heard about Beethoven. They wrote more stories about him. At the time there was already an orchestra in Shanghai, but it was only foreign as the Shanghai Symphony was actually founded in 1879. But for the first 30 or 40 years of existence, it was foreign musicians playing for foreign audiences. But in the early 1920s, uh, that started to change. They had a very open-minded conductor from Italy named Mario Pacci, and he insisted on first integrating the audiences. So they soon became a lot of Chinese people in the audience. And then one day, a young Chinese musician named Pan Shu Zhen heard that one of the Dutch musicians was on home leave, and he went and he knocked on the door of Pachi's office. And he said, I hear you're missing a violinist. I can play the violin. Why don't you let me play in the orchestra? And Pachi said, he just looked at him and he said, come tomorrow. And so this young musician showed up the next day and they were celebrating or commemorating the anniversary of Beethoven's death. It was 1927. And so they had this big concert. They played all Beethoven and he joined in it. So actually the first time a Chinese musician played in the orchestra in China was for Beethoven. So Beethoven just became more and more popular over the years. So by the 1970s, people already knew who Beethoven was. They had, um, they knew in the 1959, it was actually performed Beethoven for the uh, 10th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. They did Beethoven 9, sung in Chinese. So there's a very long history of Beethoven performances. 
Well, thanks. I um, we just shared your book in the chat, the um, Beethoven in China, and I read a little bit about it and got really interested in this story about it. So I, I thought I'd ask this question. Um, thanks. Shifting gears a little bit, um, Jia, I I know that you studied China. You studied music in China, starting in China, and then you came over to the U.S. and um, to Curtis Institute in Philadelphia and studied music, studied and performed music further. So I was wondering what this, in your perspective, what the similarities and differences in how music is taught, studied and performed in the two countries are. Um, yeah, I would love to hear your perspective on that. Sure, um, that's a great question and thank you, Erica. Um, when we talk about the similarities and differences in, in how music is taught or studied, um, you know, one line really comes to my mind, and that's Leo Tolstoy's uh, Anna Karenina, the famous opening line, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So for me, I think good music education um, it's very similar in both China and the West. However, each has their unique different point. Um, for instance, if I'm learning a Beethoven sonata, in China, the teacher would be very hands-on, very detail-oriented. Um, she or he would really go through every single detail bar by bar with me, um, sort of a very guiding through process. Whereas in the US, if I play a Beethoven sonata for my professor, uh, he wouldn't really tell me what to do. He would actually ask me and challenge me um, why I am playing certain phrases uh, that particular way and why. So that becomes like very interesting. It stimulates, um, stimulates me to look for my answers. Um, another example would be in China, we usually would be very detail focused and we will be focusing on perfecting perhaps one single set of programs, um, be it for a concert or an audition or competitions, like we will make sure um, that every single detail is perfect and polished. Um, whereas in the US, my professor just sort of say, go to the library, explore the repertoire and play as much as you can. They don't need to be polished. They don't need to be you know, perfect, but I want you to learn as much depth or breadth as possible. And then um, you can come up with the pieces that you like most. So if I have to sum it up, um, I think in China, it will be more vertically focused um, whereas in the U.S., I think it's more horizontally minded. That's really interesting. I um, a little bit of background on my personal life. I actually I lived in Chongqing, China, for a year and a half before I started working at the committee, and I worked at a music school there as a teacher, and translated classes and taught the violin. I play the violin, um, same as Booker, and. It, it was very different teaching Chinese students um, how to play the violin. I actually grew up learning the Suzuki method. So it was very rigid and strict. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a lot of Chinese Americans, Asian Americans in the US today. So I, I just, I find it fascinating how both cultures are so different, but then there are similarities in both places. Um, but teaching the violin and music in China was quite a challenge at first <laughs> because they were searching, the parents were searching for something other than what I had been taught. So I had to sort of adjust and acclimate to what they were looking for. And um, so I focused a lot on, you know, emotions and how to express emotions through music. So yeah, that's very interesting. But um, on a similar note, I'm curious about how U.S. cultural exchange is today. And so Jennifer, can you talk a, a little bit about that? Like what is cultural exchange, U.S.-China cultural exchange today in uh, particu particularly in the arts and music? Yeah, so um, we traveled with the Philadelphia Orchestra three times. So prior to, uh, to the pandemic, the orchestra was really uh, going on a very regular basis to China um, and 
in fact, you know, any major orchestra in the United States and in the world really includes uh, China on their touring schedule. So up until the pandemic, there had been a very robust uh, uh, exchange. Uh, you know, you would see all the top orchestras performing in Shanghai and Beijing. Um, in terms of of uh, the, you know the educational connection, uh, there's there's a lot of cross cultural exchange going on. The Juilliard School recently opened a branch in Tianjin. Uh, Curtis uh, doesn't have a, a you know a, a foothold in China in terms of you know a, a school, but there is a lot of exchange going on. You know the big question is now what what happens uh, you know with with the pandemic post pandemic. And, um, you know, time will tell uh, when touring resumes uh, for orchestras. But I know the Philadelphia Orchestra last year, they did a pilot program where they did a, you know, this was outreach in China and they did, um, it was a week long, uh, basically a week long course where they connected with students in China and they had some of their musicians here giving master classes and they intend to do that again. And I think it's an example of how, you know, not only in the United States, but everywhere, cultural institutions really have to kind of reinvent themselves a little bit, uh, you know, during this pandemic. And, you know, in the last two years, well, in the, the beginning of the pandemic, the, the orchestra was doing many virtual concerts and has finally resumed, you know, its full schedule. Um, but in terms of what happens with uh, cultural exchange, I, I think, I think we really don't know. And I'm gonna bounce this over to Sheila because she's much more the, the, the expert on uh, the music scene in China than I am. Do you mind, Sheila? No, I thought that was a great answer. I mean, uh, the, the jury's still out on what's gonna happen because we just don't know. What, what I'm certain of is that the interest will be there. The question is, is how it's gonna come about. Um, and it's not, it's the pandemic and then it's what's the economic situation in each country after the pandemic. Because in recent years, China's had a lot of money for the arts. You know, these art orchestras and arts organizations have touring's just not an issue. They can fund it, they can go, but I don't know what's gonna, you know, now the pandemic's bad there again. I don't know what will happen in the future, but I'm certain that American and Western orchestras will definitely wanna continue going to China because they've probably suffered even worse than the pandemic, at least thus far. And Chinese orchestras will wanna, you know, everyone's gonna wanna do cultural exchange. The question is how it's gonna come about. Um, and we may have to, you know, reconsider different ways. I saw one of the questions you had earlier was on how it's impacted the scene in China. And I think one thing that's happened is that um, this has given younger Chinese soloists and orchestras a chance to really shine because for a long time in China, there has been a, a bias, a preference for these foreign orchestras, these great orchestras like the, like the Philadelphia Orchestra to come and people would shell out massive amounts of money to hear them, but then they wouldn't go to hear the Shanghai Symphony, which performed every weekend. But obviously now they don't have that option anymore. So they've had the chance to hear their own wonderful orchestras and they put forth their own soloists and their own conductors. So I think this has probably in, in, in many ways been a good opportunity for Chinese musicians in China. Um, yeah, that, that brought it over to the future really quickly. Um, but I, I do want to backtrack just a little bit because I want to hear from Booker about um, his experience returning to China. Um, Booker, when was that? What year did you return to China? The most recent time? Oh, the most recent. Well, after 73, we went again in 20 years, 93 and then in 96. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, I think it was 2019 for me. Oh. So I, oh. Did, I, I did retire the next year after that. Um, and then the pandemic happened. But I, I was wondering, pandemic. yeah, in 2019, um, what was the situation like for musicians and audiences? In I the truth, I, I, I honestly don't remember. I don't know why I don't remember, but I just... It's, it's, it comes up as a blank. Mm -hmm. um, after that first trip, the first trip was so extraordinary mm -hmm. in, in, in so many ways that everything after that just paled. It's, it's almost like, don't give your best, absolute best <laughs> right off the bat because you can't follow it up. <laughs> and, <laughs> 
I, I mean, you can't say don't do that, but it's, it, it, it seems to suggest that idea, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, do you have... yeah. I, I, I will say one thing though. Um, one of the things is that I think helps relations is getting together and groups getting together or the symphonies, for instance, and I don't remember what symphony it was, but they called themselves the Starry Orchestra. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2017, when we were there, um, some of us from the Philly Orchestra went over and played with them in a performance. And, um, you know, it was, it was a way of, uh, you know, of getting together with other people. The problem was, of course, the biggest problem was communication, but sometimes you can get past, uh, past that um, talking shop. Uh, like for instance, um, our first bassoonist uh, in terms of giving gifts, uh, the gift that he gave was knowledge uh, for the, um, um, for, for the um, Central Philharmonic uh, first bassoonist. Uh, he, the sound he was getting was not, not so good, but what he, what he asked him to do was try to make a larger bore in, in the instrument, a larger opening. Mm -hmm. And that, that did get rid of the, it had improved the tone and the intonation. And, uh, you know, things like that. And the improvement of just even getting an instrument if they don't have an instrument to play. Um, or knowing the best, the best set of strings to use for straight, for, and also being opened opened up to a larger repertoire of music. You know, there's, there are lots of lots of, of ways of uh, communicating uh, in a situation like that. But I think it was important to just just to get the group together, and uh, and that happened in 2017 in in China. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question the way that I'm sure you'd like, but. No, that's fine. Um, I, I, thought you, I, don't, I don't remember it. <laughs> it's okay. I thought your response was very interesting. Um, but I, I, we're getting a lot of audience questions. So I, I just want to ask a couple more questions before we turn it over to audience Q&A. Um, and the next question is for Gia. You mentioned the importance of the performing arts as a medium for social change. Um, I, I read that a lot online. And, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so for me, music is always a form of human expression. And it is really a universal language of moral imagination, really, that transcends boundaries and social circumstances. So I'll take a great example is Daniel Barenboy, the pianist and conductor who brings young Arab and Israeli musicians together with his uh, West Eastern Divine Orchestra. So in another word, the setting was the Muslims, the young Muslims and the Jews were sitting side by side um, and working hard together to, towards a mutual goal, which is making beautiful music. Um, referring also to the movie that Jennifer produced, um, Beethoven in Beijing, music was really essentially the medium that united President Nixon and Premier Joy Lai together um, and dismantled 25 years of isolation between the two nations. So for me, I think um, the role cultural and musical exchange can really play now and into the future would be three pillars. Um, Number one is to maintain and improve. So I think they really can play a very important role in building a continuation of the bilateral, uh, multilateral international relationships that took so many decades um, of hard work to build and establish. Number two would be to transcend the differences. So cultural exchange, musical exchange, provides an endless possibilities for the two nations to co-develop interdisciplinary programs, you know, both on the education side 
and performing arts industry as a whole, as Sheila mentioned before. Um, everybody would love to come to China to perform, and we also would love to send our own musicians overseas to perform. And finally, I think perhaps most importantly is uniting the emotions. Um, so music provides a platform for these two nations to learn more, understand more about each other. And perhaps not just from a data point perspective, you know, GDPs, um, things like that, but more from a humane point of view and really understand each other's history, um, how one thinks, how different cultures plays in different countries. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, have a, we have a question from Michelle Scott. I am the Dean of a cooperative undergrad program in Changchun on the Northeast Normal Campus. I brought over Carolyn Dorfman Dance Company from the US. Carolyn taught a choreography dance class and many of the finance, public admin and SCM majors thought it was the best class they took. How do Chinese students convince parents that arts is a viable career? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Sheila? I think Jia should probably take a stab at that. <laughs> Jia, how did you convince your parents? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm interested actually this, um, and, and I believe this question comes from a teacher from China, right? Is that, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. All right, so I, I, I think this really tells you how much China has changed because back in my days, I think it's really the other way around. Um, the, the parents need absolutely no persuasion to, to understand and think that music is very important um, as part of the education. Um, I think the question now is that, um, you know, with the technology, with the convenience that brought uh, of international travels, people have too much choices. And uh, when you have too many choices, sometimes you get lost and you can't really separate the, the core importance from the other peripheral things. So for me, I think music education really should be become a part of say English, math, science, um, history, it really should be one part of the, the, the very basic education for human beings because it tells you the empathy, um, how to express yourself, and, um, you know, building curiosities to know the world. Um, we have another question from Calvin Hui at College of William and Mary. He says, indeed, it is true that today, quote, today, China is energizing the world of music, classical music with legions of young musicians, glittering new concert halls and a lineup of superstar performers and composers, end quote. I am curious, what is special about China? I think the same argument can be made with reference to South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. Uh, what do you think is the singularity of the China case? Well, so the same thing has happened happened in Japan post World War II, and also in Korea. I think in China there were some unique factors that led to this, uh, you know, this resurgence in classical music, and that was, uh, you know, China went through the ten years of the Cultural Revolution when it was denied you were not allowed to perform or study Western classical music, so there was a lot of pent up demand. Uh, to, to, to study this music and to enjoy this music. So, you know, Sheila tells this great anecdote in our movie, how in 1977, when the Central Film Philharmonic performed uh, Beethoven's Fifth live on TV, that people only then realized, okay, the worst is over, you know, the Cultural Revolution has ended, you can play Beethoven again. So there was this pent up demand. The other thing that was very different too in China is the one child policy. And, you know, although that's, that's been removed, you know, for much of the 80s, the 90s, families could only have one child and they would, you know, uh, 
focus all their attention on the success of that one child. And music was very much a part of that e equation. To be an educated person in China, you had to know and understand and play music. And then the third thing that's different about China uh, versus perhaps South Korea and Japan is, you know, the 80s was a period of economic boom. So all of a sudden, you know, working class families, middle class families had disposable income that they could spend on their children, that they could invest in music classes and also spend on themselves by going to concerts. Uh, you know, as, as more and more foreign orchestras tour China, as well as, you know, the, the uh, increase in the number of professional orchestras in China itself. I think the number like doubled uh, in the last few years. Um, so I think there are a lot of similarities between South Korea and Japan, but there are things about the China experience that make it uh, unique. Um, and this question is, this next question is for Sheila um, or anybody else who wants to answer it. How have recent shifts in US-China relations affected your work and how do you see continued music exchange helping the situation? Um, this is asked by Rebecca Wiener. Hi, Rebecca. Um, I would, argue, I mean, it hasn't affected my work. I mean, that would be a question for the musicians. But um, I see with my husband who runs, uh, who was at the Bard Conservatory in New York, and he runs a US China Music Institute that's trying to bring music for, and musicians from China and put them into mainstream America. You know, he's brought Chinese instruments, the arhu, the pipa, the gudong into the conservatory system. And you can major in that as, as, a, as a, you know, as a, along with violin, piano and everything else, it's, they're treated as equal, you know, in the conservatory system. So I think that all those kinds of exchanges are still going on to the extent possible. There's tremendous support for them from all the conservatories in China. As I think Jennifer mentioned, Juilliard opened up during the pandemic, it's doing really well. The interest is all there. Right now, it's really just the ability to travel. And we don't know what's going to happen after that, but I think they will resume. The other thing that's happening is China can't send orchestras here for exchanges, but it can still fund people to conduct the music. You know, so there are still performances of Chinese music, but they're being done by American orchestras, which in some way is even better because then it goes into the repertoire of the American orchestras and you have American musicians performing this music from China rather than the orchestra from China coming over here performing it mainly for Chinese American audiences. So there's some good things about this, about, about changing the way the cultural exchange takes place, even if it's not as much fun, it's still happening. Well, that, that reminds me, um, has, techno has technology played a role in this at all? I know that it, it's very difficult to communicate music through virtually. I, I no, they do the teaching over Zoom all the time. There's yeah. all kinds of classes. The Central Conservatory professors teach the students over, 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 they do it. It's probably not Zoom. They have better technology that's yeah. faster. I don't know what they're called, but there's special technology for music lessons. So it's mm -hmm. definitely happening. Yeah. Dia, do you have anything to add on that? As yeah, musician? I would just want to echo Sheila's point about, you know, Chinese pieces being played by the Western musicians, which perhaps is even more meaningful. So an example is that I transcribed the Butterfly Lover piano concertos and I have toured around with that pieces. Um, um, in fact, I recorded a uh, recording album together with New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. And what's interesting is that during the rehearsals, um, of course, a lot of the pentatonic um, themes would felt very foreign to the uh, to the Western players. So, you know, the, the conversation just naturally starts and we would discuss, oh, what is this piece about? Um, and, you know, this piece was very famously um, quoted by Premier Zhou Enlai back then to President Nixon that, well, this is actually the Chinese version of Romeo and Juliet. And that just suddenly clicked and people understand it. Um, and the plot is actually exactly the same, you know, both couple, are struggling, they share the same struggle, the same aspiration for love and happiness. And I think that's just a common human goal. Um, and also during those practices, um, they would using the Western instrument to mimic the Chinese traditional instrument and realizing that at the end of the day, we are all humans and our emotions are very much the same. Uh, yeah, can this yeah. Next one. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Booker. 
Oh, okay. I was just scratching my eyebrow, but oh, uh, oh I thought oh, you started a sentence. Yeah, but uh, I was thinking about what she just said, and um, and I quite agree that when we just performed um, um, a, a work that Lee Dellen had 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 performed with his orchestra in China years ago, he had a um, he had a uh, orchestral arrangement of it, and we did a string quartet arrangement which was, um, well, his granddaughter played with us and uh, I think it was her father who rearranged the piece for string quartet. Uh, and anyway, in the process, we had all these little uh, ornamentations that I had never seen before and had to, uh, I was asking whoever knew about them, how do you, how do you perform these? And they turned out to be similar in a lot of ways in terms of being slides, or quick slides, either up or down. Uh, and that, that was just technically what was going on. But then once we got that straightened out, uh, there was a larger story behind the whole work about the struggle of the, of, uh, of, of, the, of the nation and of the peasants and you couldn't play it too fast because it would be too easy. It would be too easy, it wouldn't show the struggle. So you had to, to, to show the struggle through the whole thing. And uh, I thought that that was a, a um, sort of a, a growth for me personally. And I've, I've played orchestra for 50 years. I haven't had to do a chance to do much chamber music or, or solo stuff. So um, that, that, that was valuable to have had that experience. Booker, are you referring to the quartet you did with Lee Delon's yes. granddaughter? Yes. It was the reflection of the moon on two fountains? On two fountains, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's actually, um, uh, Eric, an interesting story about that um, that I write about in, in the book, which is, um, when the Philadelphia Orchestra went to China, the Central Philharmonic performed that for Ormandy and his musicians, and they were really taken with it. They really uh, enjoyed the piece and they wanted to bring the music to Philadelphia audiences. So they had been given a score and the intent was when they went back to Philadelphia in 1973, they were going to perform it in the season, the upcoming season. And so the Philadelphia, uh, someone in administration needed the program notes. So he wrote to Lee Dolon, the famous conductor and said, could you send us program notes and heard nothing. So then they wrote again, you know, can you send us program notes because we want to introduce American audiences to Chinese music, nothing. Well, that was 1973, and the answer came four years later when Lee Dolun wrote uh, a letter to Eugene Ormandy. Uh, it was translated into English, and he said, sorry for the delay, but the, the click of Madame Mao Jiangqing has been smashed, and there is now an artistic revival. And here are the program notes that you asked for four years ago. So uh, it, it was just kind of an, an insight into, you know, how... The orchestra went in 73, but still the performance of classical Western classical music was still very politicized and still kind of radioactive. So, uh, you know, it was only four months after the Philadelphia Orchestra left China in 73 that there was another crackdown on Western classical music. Um, so, you know, it, it it's just an interesting uh, anecdote. And, and Booker performed this with the granddaughter of the famous Li Delun. And it was just marvelous. This was last Saturday. <laughs> I have to tell I have to tell you that unfortunately, uh, for the performance uh, that that he gave with of, of this piece, uh, it was actually Saturday the fifteenth of September of seventy three. I was so exhausted from the trip and everything we had done leading up to that that I I missed the, I missed that performance. And it was an afternoon performance that they did, I remember. But I could not make myself get up. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate the anecdotes. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, another question, this one's from John, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, so sorry if I'm not. John So, 
during COVID, where music venues were canceled, Taiwan wasn't locked down. However, in my conversations with musicians there, they told me that the student musicians didn't want to come to New York City, especially because of the anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, has this influenced how Chinese musicians feel threatened in the US? Um, well, I can answer that question. Well, certainly not during my time. Um, I went to Curtis when I was 13, that's back in uh, 1998. Um, well, you we can do the math and know how old I am now. Um, and, and, and back then it was just, it felt like family. Um, everybody, most of the students were way older than me because Curtis usually take in students at a college age, um, but they do, you know, take, you know, we, we call ourselves little pumpkins back then, um, you know, talented little kids that they wanna secure the talents that's in there and groom them up. So I was 13 when I went there and really I felt, you know, immense um, help and support um, from the school, from the community, from my teacher as a whole. Now, I do have to say when I went back to school to Harvard back in 2018, um, I do feel the dynamic has been changed a bit. Um, that was during um, Trump's administration and um, I think it was during the height of the trade war. So um, you do see a lot of, you know, hidden tensions there. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate because I really think that art is a um, bipartisan platform to bring people together. And we really should just shifting the attention back to the music itself or shifting, you know, be it any other, pro you know, subject, science, biology, anything, shift the attention to the, to, the, to the subject itself and see how we can both discover ways to, you know, co-develop better things. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you wanna say something? I think I heard something. Nope. Okay. Um, well, I'm wondering if anybody has, any of the panelists have any questions for one another? Um, just since you, you were all featured in the film and then Jennifer put this all together, I'm just wondering if um, any anybody has any questions for anybody else? Mm. Uh, Jennifer, I have a question for you. So if you, are, you know, it's like we both really worked on this film closely together and I still remember the uh, experiences when you came together with Curtis and then uh, we were, you know, arranging all these shots in, in the campus and in the concert hall. Um, and, you know, I do understand, you know, some of the struggles and hurdles that we have to jump across. And I am just so grateful and so proud that this, this film really come to fruition, you know, after six years of hard work. So, you know, as the producer and director yourself, you know, looking back, um, what would be the single most biggest challenge for you? Well, the, the hardest thing about making this movie was deciding what not to include in the story. And, and how to simplify it. And the other thing is, you know, I, I've, you know, I've lived in China, had a long interest in China, and it's, it's kind of shocking the lack of knowledge most Americans have in terms of Chinese history. So, you know, uh, a colleague, a young colleague, uh, when we started working on the film, she actually thought the Cultural Revolution would have been a positive period because she didn't know. Um, so a, a challenge was kind of not only uh, telling the story of the Philadelphia Orchestra, but putting it into context, putting it into the context of what was happening in China, you know, in, during the 70s, as well as, you know, the, the transition years of, of the 80s and the 90s. And the other thing that was challenging, and, you know, when you're, when you're making a movie, sometimes you don't find your story until you're deep in the editing process. And as we were editing the movie, we really realized that there were certain characters who really helped us to move the story along from 1973 to the present. And they were Tan Dun, 
Long Long and the composer Pung Pung. And each of those really became very important characters for us because they represented like different phases in China's, you know, in the revival of classical music. Uh, but I have to I have to give props to Sheila and Jin Dong Tsai because in when I started this project, one of my first calls was to Jin Dong and Sheila because they literally wrote the book on classical music in China, uh, Rhapsody in Red. I highly recommend it. Uh, and so, you know, I did have good guides through this process, but the hard thing was just kind of streamlining the story and making it um, understandable for an American audience. But thanks, Jay. And Jay, you were like one of the first people I reached out to also. And we went on tour. I went on tour with Jay when she took a, a group from the Curtis Institute to Shanghai. And that was really exciting. So <laughs> yeah, thank that you. Was great, great experience. Thank yeah. you. Jennifer, you did a great job on that on that movie. Really. Oh, well, Booker has kind of a, a starring role in it too. You know, <laughs> he, uh, you know, I'll never forget Booker. We we had a reunion luncheon in Beijing where we brought Philadelphia musicians who were from the '73 tour and still performing with the orchestra, together with their Chinese counterparts from the, the Central Philharmonic and. As soon as Booker walked into the restaurant, this Chinese violinist ran up to him and said, you're the one, you're the one who gave me this sheet music in 1973. And this, this lovely woman had, had saved this music all those years. And it made such an impression on her because at the time, 1973, she didn't have any of her printed music. Uh, you know, she had to hand write, rewrite all of her music. And so that meant that simple gesture Booker, we've talked about this, and I know it wasn't a, you, you said to me it wasn't a big deal, but it was. And, and <laughs> that gesture really, uh, you know, uh, the woman, her name is Sway, she still has that music and she still remembers. So it's like little yes. moments like that that were really, I think, important in terms of, of uh, you know, the relationship. She showed such interest and, I mean, genuine interest in, in just playing. And I felt that I had to give her something. And I had brought several, several things, not to give to people, but just to have chamber music to play with somebody if they wanted to. And it turned out nobody had up to that point, the opportunity hadn't shown itself, but uh, it was the Mendelssohn complete Mendelssohn court, string quartet that I gave her. And uh, I don't know. I felt I felt good. I mean, when you give somebody something that they really something for their soul, that uh, it makes a difference, and it, it makes it they made a difference to me anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, I was amazed how much they did remember it, and as you said, it was because and I didn't know that they didn't have printed music. I turns out that everything was manuscripted. Mm -hmm. um, which was a problem when it came to the Beethoven Sixth Symphony as well, uh, with with the orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, and we had to use the parts that belonged to the uh, Central Philharmonic, because uh, we were expecting to play the Fifth Symphony. Anyway, I've gotten off that subject, but uh, yeah, well, that's, that's that's the way that we got ourselves together. Uh, they they remembered forty years later in two thousand thirteen. And they gave me this, as a matter of fact. Uh, she and her husband gave me, I'm not sure what you call it. It's, uh, it could be a wall hanging. You, you would never use it as a, uh, I don't know if you can, whoops, let's get the other side. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you see this? Yeah. Yes. Very, very wide, yeah. Well, they gave me that and, and the husband gave me, a. Um, his 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 book that he is it's sort of a biography really of himself, his first bassoonist of the orchestra. So we 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 did uh, exchange gifts over a forty year period. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I want to we're running low on time now, and I I just want to do a little bit of a wrap up, but. Um, having this conversation with all of you has been really delightful. Um, the committee was also very instrumental in, you know, facilitating the trip 
the Philadelphia Orchestra's trip in 1973, as well as the Boston Symphony's uh, visit in 1979. So to be able to moderate this program, it's, it's really been an honor. So thank you so much to our thoughtful panelists. Jennifer, Booker, Sheila, and Dia. It has been really amazing to have had the opportunity to moderate this program. Um, so I, I also want to thank my colleagues who worked behind the scenes to make this program possible. And of course, thank you to the audience for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the program and found it informative. Um, we would also really appreciate if you could fill out the post-program evaluation form that will be in your inboxes shortly. Um, but thank you, everybody. Take care, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening and day. Thank, thank you. you, Erica. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.